The third strategy that wealthy people follow is real diversification. This is what the majority of people would consider diversifying their assets, which we're gonna call fake diversification. You have your money in the stock market and it's diversified across a broad array of stocks and ETFs and index funds. You might have some blue chip ETFs, you might have some growth stocks, you might have some international stocks and ETFs, and maybe you're investing in some gold companies. But the problem with this is yes, you're diversified in different types of companies, however, all of your money is tied up in one asset class, which is paper assets and stocks. And so the reason why wealthy people want to diversify away from this is because of two things. Number one is you are at risk for a stock market crash. If you start to see a major recession, you could see the broad stock market fall. And number two is all of your assets are very liquid, which means if something were to happen to you, something were to happen to your family, and now you lose full control over how your money is used, where that control starts to be diversified, which means if you make a bad decision with your money and you decide to sell your investments, it is very easy to sell. It's very easy for your kids to sell. It's very easy for your grandkids to sell. It's very easy for you to accidentally spend this money because all you need to do is push a few buttons on a computer or call your broker and sell your stocks and it's sold and you've already liquidated this money. So you kind of have that risk. This is what real diversification looks like. Real diversification be investing in completely different asset classes. So maybe you own some stocks, kind of like everything that we have here. You have a broad portfolio of stocks, but then you also have some cash and then you own some physical real estate. This is now a hard asset. This is not as liquid as stocks because to sell real estate, it's much more difficult. Then maybe you invest in or you own a business. This might be a business that you start. This might be a business that you invest in. These might be startups that you invest in, but it's a way where you're investing in companies that are not on the stock market. And generally this is gonna be less liquid than this as well. And then maybe you own some physical gold. Again, a hard asset. I'm not talking about investing in paper gold. I'm talking about investing in the physical gold. And the reason why this can benefit an investor, especially as you start to build more wealth, is now you own different asset classes, which means you protect yourself in different phases of the economy because there will be phases in the economy where stocks do bad and real estate does good, or stocks do bad and gold does good. There will be phases where stocks do good and your business does bad. And so now you have that sort of financial diversification, but also if you were to accidentally make a bad decision and sell your stocks, will you still own other assets as well? And it's harder to sell out on some of these assets because we've all heard stories or many of us have heard stories of situations where people will come in and sell an investment where they don't want to. And it's very easy to do that when you have liquid assets, but it's harder to make an irrational sales decision when you own a hard asset. And this brings me to number four, owning real estate. Now I hinted at this throughout the video, but I wanna hammer this home here because the reason why wealthy people love investing in real estate isn't just because you have the ability to make money, which is one reason you get cash flow, but it's also because of the tax benefits and the estate planning benefits that you get with real estate as well. So let me break this down. Let's assume that you go out and you buy this single family home for $250,000. This building, the actual house is worth $200,000 and the value of the land is $50,000. You'll see why that matters in just a minute. Now you're buying this as a rental property, you're not buying it to live in yourself. So now you go out and you rent this property for $2,500 a month and that is about $30,000 a year in rental income. So this is not the money you make in profit, this is your revenue. So you make $30,000 a year and then you have to have your expenses. And for the sake of this video, I'm going to assume that you have $15,000 in expenses. So that means that you net $15,000 after all of your expenses. So you have $15,000 in your bank account at the end of the year. This is the first benefit that wealthy people talk about, which is cash flow. And for all of you watching this video, getting ready to say, well, does breathe, where in the world am I gonna find a property for $250,000 that I'm gonna rent out for $2,500 a year? You can find these properties in Michigan all day and night long that real estate investors are taking advantage of. Just look somewhere else. If you're in Manhattan, if you're in Los Angeles, you're not gonna find these properties, but if you do some due diligence, you'll find other properties in different states where you can find these types of deals with not that much difficulty. So you make $15,000 a year in profit in your bank account. Now that's the first benefit, which is the cash flow. The second benefit is the tax breaks. And what that means is if you invest in real estate, the IRS tax code says that you deserve a tax write-off because your property is one year older, even if your property goes up in value. 
So if you invest in single family real estate, what that means is you take the value of the building, that's $200,000, and you divide that by 27 and a half. So you take $200,000 divided by 27 and a half, and that gives us around $7,200. And what that means is for the next 27 and a half years, you get a $7,200 tax write-off, a deduction, paper deduction. And by paper deduction, I mean this is a tax write-off on paper. It's not actual money that you have to pay just because your property is one year older. So you have $15,000 in the bank account. Then you tell the IRS, hey, I have a property that's one year older, so I deserve a $7,200 a year tax write-off, which means your taxable income is about $7,800. This is your true taxable income as opposed to the $15,000, even though you have 15 grand in the bank. So you have $15,000 of profit, your taxable income is $7,800 because you get to take this depreciation deduction. And by the way, this number that you use is gonna depend on what type of property it is. For commercial properties, it's 39 years. For single family homes, it's 27 and a half years. And then of course you get the third benefit, which is you own a hard asset. And what that means is you own a property that you can see, feel, and touch. Unlike a stock where you own a piece of paper which says you own ownership in something. Here you own something that you can see, feel, and touch. It's not liquid, which is a pro and a con. It's a con because it takes more time to sell it, but it's a pro because you won't be as likely to make a irrational sale of a property because it's a little bit more difficult to sell. And this is why wealthy people love owning real estate and investing in real estate, not just because you have the ability to make money, but because you get these benefits as well. And the fifth way that wealthy people protect their assets is through insurance. Now, I don't like talking about this because Nobody wants to pay for insurance, but the reality is it is a necessity that you need in order to protect you. It's a small price you pay today to protect you against a big headache in the future, and I know insurance is expensive. There are so many different types of insurances, and it feels like there's always just a new type of insurance that you need, but I'll tell you from experience, because I have used my insurances in many different areas, if you don't get insurance, it can end up costing you a whole lot more. And let me give you an example of what I mean. I bought a property, I bought an apartment complex that I'm just gonna draw right here. It's on a lake. So this right here is a lake and this apartment complex was on four different parcels of land. So it's one thing that I bought, four parcels of land, and then you had buildings like this where there was buildings on multiple parcels of land. It was three or four buildings kind of like this. And what ended up happening is I purchased the property, I got title insurance because my attorney told me and you need title insurance, but my attorney helped me find a good title insurance company. We go through the process and the seller sells me the property. This property is in very rough shape, by the way. We're buying this out of uh, a distressed sale. The seller was a hotel person who didn't know how to manage apartment complexes, got into a lot of trouble and now needed to sell the property. So we sell the property, we go through everything. The title insurance says that everything is good in the property. My attorney says everything is good. And then about a year in, my attorney gets a letter saying that this property just went through foreclosure. That apparently this parcel of land here had a lien on it. It had a loan on it from the previous owner of the property, he didn't tell anybody, and then as soon as he sold the property to me, he walked away and didn't pay the loan, and nobody knew. And so now the mortgage company that owned the loan stopped getting paid, and then they ended up foreclosing on this parcel of land. Now you can start to see why that's a problem, because number one, I owned this property, or at least I thought I did, and then number two, because now they want their right to this property, this land, and this portion of rents. And so now I was confused as to what do I do because I didn't know there was a loan on this property. My attorney didn't know there was a loan on this property. My title insurance company didn't know there was a loan on this property. Nobody knew except the seller. So what did we do? We call up the title insurance company because the title insurance company's job is to make sure you're buying what you think you're buying and not have to deal with these types of liens. So we told the title insurance company and now it was their job to pay off that bank and they paid the bank a six-figure check to make them go away, but then the bank then gave me my property back and then things got better. But you can start to see why it was so important for me to have that title insurance because, well, you don't wanna to have to deal with these things and then pay for it out of your own pocket. So look at getting insurances, get a health insurance. 
get a car insurance, get a good house insurance, get yourself life insurance if you don't have your wealth built yet, get yourself business insurance if you own a business. There are many different levels of insurance that you can consider getting, and I get it. It is annoying, it is expensive, but it is a cost of doing business. You better get yourself some business insurance because there's a saying in the business and the real estate investing world that if you haven't been sued yet, you haven't been in business long enough. As an attorney, I can tell you that America is the most litigious country in the world and people love suing people for anything that you can imagine. Get yourself some good insurance, protect yourself from those future headaches. If you enjoyed this clip and you wanna continue your financial education journey, I have another video that I think you'll love. All you gotta do is click that button right over there. And for those of you who wanna stay up to date on the top finance and business news, you can join Market Briefs, my free financial newsletter, by clicking that button below. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.